Right, welcome everyone to Fazlif's podcast, <laughs> episode 22. Uh, special guest with me today is Kate Gilbert. Uh, welcome to the show, Kate. How are you doing? How's it going? Yeah, good, 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 good. Um, so Kate and I have been friends for a uh, good few years now off the forums. Uh, Kate is a coach himself. He's been training for a good long while, had a good degree of success in uh, physique and in strength. So uh, Kate, just going to let you do a quick intro for yourself to fill in any blanks. Hmm. Well, I started training when I was about 15 or so, just due to football, which is American football for anybody on your side of the pond. <laughs> um, after that got done with, uh, I just got into powerlifting for ego sports, you know, um, give me something to do. And then over the time, just all the forums, Facebook and whatnot, people asking me for help for stuff, ended up coaching. And uh, I just try to get rid of that neurotic side in people, I guess, nowadays. Um, just try to keep things simple for the coaching aspect. Um, personally, people ask me if I want to compete again or anything. That does not interest me at all. I'm kind of over that. But I guess that's – that'll work, huh? Is that good? Yeah, that's great. I, I wasn't aware you stepped on stage. Was that uh, – when was that? Yeah, so I think um, about four years ago. Okay, cool. Cool, cool, yeah. cool. Yeah, awesome. awesome. Yeah. Um, yeah, so Kate's approach to coaching is very much like my own in that in, in the overall overriding philosophy, you'll see we differ on quite a few things, but the overriding philosophy is just a case of trying to figure out the route from A to B with the least amount of stress as possible. So without all the bells and whistles, just getting someone from A to B, um, because that's really the hardest part. Uh, without having to do a lot of unnecessary things, so to make things fit into a person's lifestyle. So um, the overriding approaches are, are so overriding philosophies are similar, but I think approaches can be quite different. Mm -hmm. So when I when I first uh, sort of started talking to Kate a few years back, and uh, we were he was you were quite you were quite young. I think you were in like our version of college back then. Um, yeah, I was about twenty or nineteen. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and yeah. so you were on. Is our vision of university? I should say. So you were doing a lot of walking on your campus, and your your calor caloric needs were insane. Um, yeah. Your caloric <laughs> needs were were like they were as high. I've only seen one guy around my area who has caloric needs the same as you, and his his was pretty much the same. His was about five or six thousand calories. Um, so one of the first questions is. Um, how how would you go about increasing appetite and being able to handle huge amounts of food? What are some sort of takeaways for somebody? For let's say if you were coaching a young you, what what would your what would your um, sort of your strategies be? So try to get them to have more food coming in. Yeah, really get their appetite yeah. up okay. and being able to sort of process the huge amounts of food. Well, I think the first thing is that most people try to eat too much. Okay, there's like a certain cap that you have in order to gain muscle. Um, in regards with intake, and it's something like 250 calories. You see that people having issues mainly with that because they're overeating by like 500 or 1,000 calories a day. Mm. Two weeks later, they end up gaining like a bunch of fat, and then they're like, well, I, I need to eat more, and they're just going off of measurements of the skill. You know how guys are. You just want to see the skill go up. Mm. So first thing is to make sure that you're eating what you need to eat and not overdoing it. Um, second thing, digestion. And then food choices. Um, digestive enzymes, I'm a big proponent of them. Uh, I just add some back in just because I'm trying to gain again. And uh, the reflux was not nice. So just anything that you can get for digestive enzymes, they're kind of cheap. I'm not going to really plug a company. They all work. Hmm. Um, another thing, food choice. If you can't digest oatmeal or sweet potatoes or something, you don't need to eat it. For me, a lot of simple carbs and whatnot, like rice, white rice, um, a lot of bread products and whatnot. And then I might get flack for this because of some people that are in the industry for health reasons. But, I mean, kitty cereal, ice cream, all that kind of stuff. It's all good. I mean, it's calories at the end of the day. Yeah. I'm sure everybody did, like, mass gainer products at one point in time. If you look at it. There's literally no difference between that and a pint of Ben and Jerry's. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it is what it is. So mainly just picking like more dense uh, food choices and then cutting back on the volume foods. Because mm -hmm. you pretty much do the opposite of what you would do whenever you're trying to cut down. Okay. Um, a lot of people that cut down, they get used to eating quote unquote healthy food choices. So they're eating giant salads all day. 
And then they get to a point, okay, I want to gain muscle. And then they don't change anything. They just try to add more stuff on top of it. Hmm. And no, you, you got to cut back on the food volume a yeah. little bit. Yeah. Um, yeah, but I yeah. Agree. I, I just want to uh, expand on one point. I found it quite interesting that when you answered that question, you were talking more about foods. But I know mm-hmm. that you're a big proponent of the Fifitch Macros approach, but you didn't really talk about macros and preferences. Um, why is that? And would are there are there preferential macros that you would add? Well, so I'm a coach with uh, Macros Incorporated. Um, you know, and what I'm trying to do is to make everything more flexible and not make people be neurotic. Because you'll see people come in, they have 10 grams of fat at the end of the day, and they're like, oh my gosh, what can I eat? And then somebody mm-hmm. will suggest them to go take a shot of olive oil. You know, It's like, no, you don't need to do that. Just main thing that matters is caloric intake and then protein. Okay, mm-hmm. Once you hit your protein needs, the other two really don't matter at the end of the day. Yeah, sure, uh, each individual will have a preference. Mm-hmm. Okay, And each individual will be able to handle one or the other better. It just depends. And that's for the person to find out. And then as a coach us to perhaps nudge the bone in the direction that we kind of want them to go to. Mm-hmm. Um, like have a fat minimum, you know, if you're eating less than 40 grams of fat a day, you might want to bump that. Mm-hmm. But main thing is calories. In terms of, in terms of specifically yeah. adding food uh, and handling, let's say you'd say we've got that young Kate again, five, to 6,000 mm-hmm. calories. We need to add some more food in. Uh, you've mentioned sort of, foods that agree with you but is there as a general rule is are there any macros you specifically move towards um high carbs carbs yeah and then yeah yeah and then whenever that gets to be too much just add fats i mean okay let's see you add a bagel okay Mm -hmm. into your diet and then the next week you haven't gained anything what can you do add some peanut butter add some fat to it boom it's like literally no difference in food volume yeah i like that Uh, yeah. yeah yeah I like that because it's a, it, again, it's a good match between macros and impracticality because you're thinking mm-hmm. about the actual foods to, to be added in. Why wouldn't you immediately add fats? Well, you can. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, if you're coming out of a contest print, most people in the bodybuilding world tend to do lower fats to begin with. So, yeah. like, back to the point I said before with the salads and whatnot, if you add, like, a tablespoon of olive oil right there to, like, two salads a day, that's already 300 calories you added to your diet. Yeah, and you won't notice it. Mm. Yeah. So, is um have you found fats to sort of slow the? I mean, they slow their just people to meals, but have you found increased fats to affect how much food someone could take you during the course of the day? Because you have the practical element of with that much food, you may be able to be having a thousand calorie meal every few hours. So, is it going to slow down and and leave you in a bad spot for your next meal? I mean, it, again, it's based on the individual and. Yeah. I'm sure you know, because you've done keto before, whenever you first start, your body is not used to digesting all the fats and just goes through you. So you kind of want to ease into the fat intake. I don't want somebody to add 50 grams of fat to their diet the next day and then they run into the bathroom every five minutes. (laughs) So um, now does it slow gastric emptying? Um, That just depends. I'm sure we all can, like, okay, let's say you eat a steak. I'm sure most of us will be like, we're full for like a few hours after, Yeah, you know, um, or if you go eat half a tub of peanut butter, you're not going to be full immediately, but like an hour later, you're going to be like grabbing your stomach. Cause it's like, okay, that's way too much fat. I just had. Yeah. Um, but again, it's individual. Okay. That's great. I'm got... like, Oh yeah. Go on. What's that? Yeah, no, go ahead. I'm done. I was going to say, there's a, there's a couple of couple of segues I want to go on to this. So one, I'm going to just talk about one of the one of the weight gaining phases that I had, which didn't go as well from a digestive point of view. In I was consuming quite high amounts of fat. I was thinking I was up to about 120, 150 grams of fat a day. So it's a fair, it's a fair amount. Um, I think more like 120. But I, I found that to, to definitely affect um, how much food I could pack in during the course of the day and how sluggish I felt. So for me, certainly when I'm bulking, I try and bump up the other macros uh, more so. And that, that may well be related to food choices as well. Uh, but that was uh-huh. something that I've, I found. But the other, the other kind of segue I wanted to talk about was um, protein intake. So we had um, Sid Rai on the podcast um, the last episode. And he made, he made me really think about protein intake 
what are your recommendations? What are your experiences? And um, what are your thoughts on, firstly, your own recommendations and also what he said? So Sid has always been super high protein. Mm -hmm. uh, my first initial like introduction to the BV world is through Dante. Mm. Um, his thing was two grams per pound. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So I was 19, 18, 20, eating about 400 grams of protein a day. Okay. Mm. I was pretty lean. Yeah. I looked relatively decent, you know? So it's like, okay, it worked. Mm. Um, and I'll say something my uncle said, would, would he go fishing? You know, I wouldn't catch anything. He's like, dude, see those people over there? They're catching fish, right? Maybe it'd be smart to do what they're doing, <laughs> you know. So <laughs> to go into this, if you know, people were like kind of like yeah, peeing like on the big guys in the gym. Yes. Uh, yeah. if, if it's working for them, it might work for you. Now, yeah. practicality: not everybody wants to shovel 300, 400 grams of protein down mm. a day. And Sid himself will say, "Well, it's not for everybody, right? Um, it really isn't because." I mean, some people are going to gag on protein shakes after a while. Now, basic scientific recommendations is about 0.8 to 1.2 grams per pound of lean body mass. So for me, that's like 140 and 150 grams a day. That's all that I need to hit a threshold. Okay. Uh, bulking, you don't need as much protein as you would need dieting just due to the substrates you'll get from carbohydrates in order to, um, well, Whenever you're dieting, obviously your body's going to pull from more of your muscle yeah. in order to catabolize and have an energy source. Yeah, I so, mean, anyone who's been dieting for a long period of time will know that your hair growth slows yeah. down, nail growth slows yeah. down, you know, yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. So in my opinion, I think it's safer to, you know, err on the side of caution and overeat protein whenever you're leaning out. Um, gaining, again, it's just personal preference. Whenever you're adding about 1,000 calories to your diet, you're going to get a lot of trace protein sources. Especially if you eat like bread products, a bagel itself has 10 grams of protein. Okay. Um, it, everything adds up. Uh, older individuals, like since we're on the topic of protein, um, I'm big on leucine supplementation, especially if you're after uh, 50, just due to the threshold. You need about two and a half grams of leucine per meal in order to maximally stimulate your protein synthesis. Okay. So, like a scoop of whey. It's 25 grams of protein. You're already there of the scoop of whey. Whey is like the best thing in regards to leucine content. Um, but basic recommendations and what I have for like a gin pop people, I have them hit a minimal amount, which is 0.8 grams per pound of lean body mass. For people that are like in contest prep and whatnot, body weight, minimum, um, just super simple stuff. Let's, let's take it back to this example of um, somebody who's trying to handle huge amounts of food. And if we have their protein levels set at, say, 0.8 grams uh, um, per pound of body weight, their carbohydrate levels are going to have to be astronomically high. So mm -hmm. in, in that case, I, I really want to get sort of deep dive. I know we have the science behind it, and I know we have the sort of the bodybuilding world, which generally tends to favor high protein. I want to try and get your opinion on, on – how how do we how do we meet those two in the middle? Like, where who's right in that sense, or is it just a case of different audiences, or do bodybuilders have it completely wrong, or science hasn't studied it yet? Like, this is a real area of interest for me, and uh, I kind of want to get your thoughts on that. Do you think do you think that that amount of protein that bodybuilders have traditionally done is just way overkill, and they've just done it wrong, or you know, like you said, success leaves clues, and you should do what the big people are doing. So, is there room for that, and has the science not quite got there yet? Well. I don't really like. I don't really see much study wise in regards to. Okay, you overeat protein by this much, you end up gaining more uh, muscle mass. There's well, nothing to. I, well, actually, I, I I'll tell you. I saw a really good study, um, fairly recently. Um, I think it's a few years old now. I I only saw it recently. So they had two groups of people, on roughly I think it was like a slight slight surplus. Um, mm -hmm. Now. They gave one group of people, in addition to the you know the constant um, elements of the rest of the diet, the protein, carbs, and fats, they gave one group of people an extra 500 calories just from protein. So not mm -hmm. only were they in a surplus, but they were in an even larger surplus because all the they had an extra 500 calories. So I think I think both groups were in a surplus of about 200 calories, 
And then the second group ended up being a surplus of 700 calories because 500 calories of that came from protein, if you see what I'm saying, if I'm clear enough. Yes. Yes. Now, the, the first group, who was the, just a regular protein group, they ended up gaining a little bit of muscle but not losing any fat. The second group actually ended up getting more muscle and losing fat. Okay, you this bring up something that I was cut. going to bring up. I was going yeah. to bring that up. So oh, really? Okay, study, cool. Yeah. Um, I don't, it, like, they were self-tracking their intake, right? Uh, they never right. have a shake at night or something at the end of the day. Yeah. So if you think about it, you have someone drinking a 500-calorie shake on top of their regular meals eaten at Libitum. Yeah. Okay. Um, I don't think they're going to eat like they normally would. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If they wake up, if they go to bed and they drink about 600 calories or whatever from protein, they're not going to eat the regular breakfast the next day, most likely. Yeah. So the loss in body fat, I think, is more so due to perhaps the thermic effect of protein. Protein mm. actually has about 3.2 grams, um, I mean, 3.2 calories per gram at the end of the day just due to the thermic effect of digesting it. Mm. And then add that into how sa like satiating it is, mm. they're not going to eat the same as they normally would. That's my perspective on that. That's what Let's I found as well. It. Yeah, I agree yeah. with that. That's what I found as well. Um, yeah. So in, just get, taking it back to the original question. So old school bodybuilders, two grams per pound, 1.5 grams per pound. Thoughts on that? Any viability so, that at all? Well, I mean, it worked. Yeah, it works, right? Yeah. <laughs> so um, just to go into high protein, uh, protein, like, you know, PSMF, uh, a la Lyle McDonald. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, what does high protein do? It keeps you full, right? Um, you're not going to really want to overeat much of anything else until like the end of the day and you're like starving death face lean so i know sid he can put away some food okay mm. he stays pretty lean year round yeah uh, a lot of the, you know most bodybuilders they stay relatively lean year round um bodybuilders we like to eat we like a lot of food most of us do mm. so um in order to control intake it, even though it's probably not conscious consciously done at all having a higher protein intake kind of like you know forces you or doesn't allow you to say binge on carbs or fats all day and you just kind of stay full with the protein intake yeah. now back to the increase in protein synthesis hmm. i don't really see much i can't remember who did a study but they did do the two grams per pound and they had no side effects of like liver issues because everybody's like oh you're going to destroy your kidneys and liver. <laughs> yeah. you know, just and that's not the case uh if anything, it's just, you know, satiating, in my opinion. But whenever they have something else come out, you know, would that make me change my intake if they have a steady showing that? Uh, I don't really think so. Because <laughs> it, it depends on how significant it is. You know, keep in mind the type of people that were around with, like, you know, bodybuilding. It's neurotic type A type people. Mm -hmm. Um and that extra one or two percent matters to them. Hmm. Now to your lay person that we're trying to just have them get basic results and just have them track their diet. Nah, nah they don't need to worry about that. Hmm. So, yeah. So there's this potential application at the higher levels, but for gen pop mm -hmm. majority people, probably not. I, I'd say it's safe. Yeah. 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 Okay. That's interesting. I'm uh, the reason I sort of went off into that uh, segue is I've, I've, I've been experimenting with that myself recently, so I'm not quite prepared to make any statements on it yet, but it's been interesting so far. And it, certainly everything that you said related to appetite holds completely true for what I've seen so mm -hmm. far. Everything that you well, said. About, I've um, been wondering what you're doing because you mentioned it a few times on the forums. And yeah. I, like, oh, I, wonder, I didn't know if it was about fasting or what. The fasting stuff I'm still doing, I'm pretty happy with that. I do that about once a week because I'm now uh, sort of re lean bulking, recompositioning, but I'm experimenting with a much higher protein intakes. Uh, than I've ever had before um, and it's been an interesting experience yeah it certainly has I've seen I, I yeah I, it's difficult I'm not I'm not one of those coaches who is going to just proclaim it to be the best thing ever after three weeks <laughs> I hate it when people do that so I'm not prepared to make any kind of statement on it yet because there's so many variables involved but um, at the moment you know things are going pretty well so I'll I'll kind of talk more about that in a couple of months I think when I've got something concrete that I can tell people, but uh, it was it was definitely it definitely was after the podcast with Sid, uh, and that made me look into some of the research and question things that I thought were pretty solid, which I realized may not be actually quite as solid as I thought. So, uh, 
yeah. Well, I, I could go back into negatives. Um, if somebody's coming to me and they're having issues getting food in and they have about 400 grams of protein in their diet, uh, maybe drop that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. that a little bit. So yeah. um, digestibility, because, I mean, protein is harder to digest. Um, and then, you know, just not being able to get the food down. That's probably the negatives from that. Otherwise, you know, keep doing what you're doing. Yeah, that, that's for me, it, that's been pretty easy. So it's about 2 p.m. now, about 20, 20 past 2. I've, I've already, I'm already on about 220 grams of protein. Um, yeah. And so I've got a, a fair whack more to, to go. But I've, got, I've got lots of the day left, so plenty more to have a chance to get protein in. I, my digestion does a lot better on high protein than it does on high fat. High fat, not so great for me. It definitely slows everything down. Um, Which I find interesting because I yeah. just know you as a keto guy from before. Oh really? <laughs> yeah. You know, I've only yeah. done it once or twice. I've probably talked about it a lot, but I've only done it once or twice. I'm, I'm mostly the fasting guy. I'm, I'm the old fasting guy now. That's what I do. <laughs> well, let me also clarify. During my last diet, I just got done with. Uh, at the end, I was pretty much getting about 300 grams of protein a day. Okay. Um, nice. And which, yeah, which so would have been I'm not biased. Yeah, which would have been not quite. End of your diet, you must be pretty lean. How how how, how much did you weigh then? I think 173 or so. Right yeah, now. that's right. Well, yeah. Know, I remember. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So not quite up to two grams, but right about 1.5 to 1.7 ish. More than what I've done in a long time. Yeah. 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 Interesting. Yeah, it's one of those things where I'm I'm interested to see what the experimentation will do and will result in. It's yeah. I mean, me personally, my my training is a whole another big tangent, but I've I've definitely as science as science business as I am, I've turned a lot more bro over the years. Um, but it yeah, works. it works. Yeah, well, but it it's works. that's something to discuss another time. Now, um, duh, duh, duh. Uh, yeah, quick question relating to that: Do you miss eating six thousand calories a day? <laughs> I actually told Alex the other day um, <laughs> when I was eating five or six thousand calories. Bear in mind, I was about one hundred and ninety average throughout that time. Um, my peak body weight is about two ten, two fifteen. Wow. Um, so I was eating about five to 6,000 calories just to maintain that body weight. I didn't realize and, you got up that heavy. That's, that's really good. Huge. Yeah. I, I think I sent you a picture of me at that time. My I legs are standing yeah. out more than anything. I think I you did. I think quads. you did. Yeah. yeah, I think you did. I just didn't realize um, you were that heavy. You, you were huge. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, pictures, it just hides it. <laughs> <laughs> but um, do I miss it? I, at the time, no. Because you're like pounding food away. You get literally yeah. sick of food. A lot of people are like, how can you get sick of food? It's like, you don't know until you know. You can. Whenever yeah. You're, yeah. yeah you, it ends up being your birthday, and the last thing you want to do is look at cake. Yeah. You know you're eating a lot of food. Even a fatty, um, even a fatty like me gets sick of food. Yeah. It's, it's just <laughs> nature, right? Yeah. Sure. Um, and now, I, I kind of like doubled my intake since my diet, but like I mentioned to Alex, it's like you, you kind of miss it because I could eat a pint of ice cream every night. I was eating fast food every day. Um, mm. And I still had another, like, you know, bear in mind, I still had striated glutes. So yeah. It's not like I was fat no, no, um, no. eating that much every day. It wasn't, yeah, yeah so. to clarify for the audience, it wasn't a dirty book at all. Like, Kate never got fat up to 210. So that's a big 210. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So, like, I, I kind of let myself go in the last year or so, and then I got back on it. But before, yeah, just pretty, say pretty lean year round. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. All right. So we'll move on to the next question, which is kind of the, the big, the big sort of topic that you and I have discussed on and off for quite a while over just through DMS and stuff. But, um, this was a question from Warren. <laughs> yeah. This is a question from Warren and it, 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 it's a nice segue into, um, to kind of the main part of this, of this talk. Do y'all, you know, I can't say y'all. I don't know how y'all y'all. I, I, awesome. I, 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 <laughs> As, as an Englishman, I sound like I'm having a stroke if I say y'all. So I'm going to say, do you all perceive lower volume? <laughs> <laughs> do, you all, do you all perceive lower volume, high intensity approaches to be that much better for growth? I think this is definitely a question directed at yourself because I'm, I'm not of that opinion. So let's talk about, let's, let's give your stance on that first. Then I'll give my stance. And then there are, there are like topics within that we can talk about. Okay. I'm going to take a little paraphrase something from Vince Geronda. Mm -hmm. Someone asked him which, you know, rep scheme or whatever was the best. And he basically said, um, it's just all made up numbers. The only thing that matters at the end of the day is effort, <laughs> progression over time. Yeah. So it's not that one's necessarily better. 
Um, it really just depends on where you're at in your training life. Uh, your, you know, how your body is made basically. Cause if you're a little scrawny guy, I'm not going to have you do heavy, heavy duty training. Um, and then personality, <laughs> that's another thing. I mean, some people just like to pound weights and beat themselves up. Mm-hmm. Well then by all means, go ahead and do some heavy duty JP style training. Um, you have the, well, okay. Like some other types, I think that's how you say it. I've never actually said it out loud. Sm- some other um, types. Hmm. Yeah. Like XMR, you know, it's me. It was originally based off personality. Mm-hmm. Okay. So let's say XMR. They tend to be high strung, anxious, fidgety type people. Um, and what do those people tend to look like? They tend to be a little bit leaner, right? Um, I mean, it, those people, I'm not, I'm not going to have them rest three minutes in between sets. They go crazy. Yeah. <laughs> they would go crazy resting that long. So for them, I'd say more volume type training. Hmm. Um, and then endomorphs, they can handle stuff better. They tend to have better joints, I guess. And then have more heavy duty style training with them. I like the fact that you talked about personality because I think the moment that you said somatotype, you would have had like, a, a well, I won't say a million because not many people listen to this podcast, but you would have had a lot of evidence-based coaches who go, oh, well, actually, there's no such thing as somatotypes. So uh, we yeah. would have had a lot yeah. of people. But yeah. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. Now, uh, I mean, I, me and you have been talking about this, and we don't disagree on it at the end of the day. Um but as you get older, and mind you, I'm about, I'm almost 25, I'm already beat up, okay? I've been doing heavy-duty style training for maybe, not necessarily heavy-duty, but lower volume, say, six to ten sets per body part per week, and it beats you up after a while. Yeah. Um, and if you're training every day, six times a week, you know, you can't go in and do super high intensity with 20 sets per body part, you might have to lower the intensity a little bit. But I, I, let's see what your questions are on this or topics and because I'm covering like 10 different things all yeah, at yeah, once. Yeah. So I'll, I'll give you my stance on it as well and we can kind of go through the different um, uh, sections. So do I perceive low volume, high intensity approach to be that much better for growth? Me personally, I don't. I'll, I'll give a f- relatively blanket statement to say that I prefer high volume, moderate intensity approaches. Um, I think that people who are suited to low volume, high intensity approaches, like your Dorian Yates and your J- JPs, could actually benefit from every type of training because I think they're gifted enough to benefit from everything. Um, I think for the most part, it's a combination of muscle stimulus, um, tendon strength, and motivation. Uh, each of those are separate topics in themselves, which I think um, lend themselves more to, uh, when we consider them in isolation, it lends itself more to high volume being a superior approach. This is, I kind of, I'm going to, going to put that out there. Um, but potentially to be just be to, to potentially just to uh, juxtapose your position. So there you go. <laughs> so, <laughs> but um, going to put that out there. And I, that's, that's my kind of stance on this. So let's start with safety and longevity and we can kind of include um, form in that as well. What, what do you think? Uh, Main thing is you want form, right? Okay, what we're looking for is progressive overload. Um, should should we start with what's needed to elicit muscle growth? Yeah, let's do that. Okay, that. Yeah, yeah, let's start. Okay. Yeah. Um, main thing is okay. All you need is about two to three sets per muscle group per session in order to stimulate muscle growth. Now, that's pretty like balls to the wall type training, right? Whenever you're an intermediate or a beginner, it's pretty easy. You know, whenever you get to be like advanced and you're benching 315 plus, squatting 405 plus, pulling 500 plus on deadlifts, you're going to beat your body up. I don't care what exercises you're doing. Um, you're going to beat your body up if you're going balls to the wall uh, three times a week. Okay, so eventually you kind of cut back on your frequency. And if you look at Dante's training with dog crap, um, it's once every four or once every five days. You, know, you train three times a week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Um, so you pull back the frequency and well, you can hit it hard pretty much, right? You kind of look forward to go to the gym. Now, let's say you're doing, let's say you were doing legs three times a week, going super, super heavy to failure. Um, doing say, you know, sets of 10, you're going to get beat up. Your joints are getting beat up. And, and after a while, you're just not going to do anything. Now, 
I'll use Scott Stevenson, an example. He has this Fortitude setup um, made for that. So I'm sure as you know, Casey Butt and with your own uh, full body type trainings, you go through the week a heavy light, light medium. Mm-hmm. So it's better on the joints. You can still hit the muscles frequently. Intensity is still there as in heavy within the rep range. Because yeah. people want to argue sets of 20 is not heavy. If you're doing sets of 20 with 315 on a squat, that's heavy. Yeah, it's, it's relative. <laughs> it's heavy. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So let's get that out of the way because somebody's going to argue about that. Um, so now you have, you know, one day is a set of 10, one day is a set of 20, one day is a set of 15. Awesome. Great. We go on the balls to the wall. Now, this really just depends on the person, but if you're training, let's say you can't make it to the gym that often, I do think higher intensity training is better for those type of people. Because if you can only make it to the gym three times a week, just due to life and whatnot, I'm not going to have you do five sets on every body part. <laughs> you know, go in, do one or two hard sets, and then get out. Mm-hmm. One or two hard sets per muscle group. Um, now, if it's like you, you like to go to the gym. Um, you can train six times a week, no issue. You go in and beating up your CNS system, you know, six days a week, it's not going to, you know, be that good at the end of the day. Um, I know you did a full body with uh, Tom, I think, mm, and that's yeah, whenever you were, like, yeah. your strongest, and you, right. you beat yourself up. Yeah. Mm. So that right there, did you get results? Yeah. But did you feel like crap? Yeah. That's mm-hmm. what you said, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, it also depends on how often you go to the gym. A lot of people, though, that are – like intermediate to advanced, I tend to start them off on a lower volume routine just to see if they can even train properly. Because if they come to me and they're like, oh, this is super easy, I know that they don't know what they're doing. Um, if they're doing like two sets for, let's say, uh, bench or whatever, and they don't get sore or don't get a pump, they don't know how to activate the muscle then. Um, they don't know how to train hard. They don't know what actual failure is. Yeah. And that's something you bring up a lot. Definitely. So if I know that they can do that, then yeah, we're, we can add some volume in. But I don't want someone to do, you know, 20 sets of flies and not stimulate the muscle group at all. And they just end up hugging the air the whole entire time. Mm, yeah. Um, and, you know, it's just progression over time. I think, I think in sort of counter to that, I might make the point that being time limited, that's not related to optimality mm-hmm. so because someone is time limited so they only want to be in the gym for three days a week that's not necessarily a reason to say that the lower volume approach is better it might be better mm-hmm. for them but it's, it's not related to optimality the, the thing that i would sort of point back to so on on the back of that i would say i did the low volume approach for all of my early years of lifting and i got to a certain point and um, the numbers that were suggested that we get to were sort of a three-plate bench, four-plate squat, five-plate deadlift. I never reached those with a low-volume approach, and I was committed. I was 100% committed to a low-volume approach. It was only when I ventured out into higher volumes and some forms of periodization that I actually surpassed those numbers. And there are, there are large bodies of people within the hard gainer um, circles who are still have made zero progress in 20 years because they insist on doing the low-volume stuff. So I would say... It, it get you somewhere. This is kind of my point related to, to time limiting not being re- related to optimality. It's like a lot of those guys, they're like, well, we don't want to go to the gym more than two, three days a week. It's like, well, fine, but you're not going to get advanced doing that. So yeah. I think I think yeah. it's a separate conversation. Well, well, okay. So what is optimal? Optimal is individual. Yeah. Um, it also depends on who we're talking about. Are we talking about our gen pop people or uh, competitors? Well, this is the thing. I'm, I'm not sure we need to talk about optimality for gen pop because for gen pop, they're going to go in, they're going to get the results in whatever, by whatever limitations they can. But if you've got somebody who's looking for the best approach for growth, that's mm-hmm. kind of where I th- that's where a lot of our audience, and certainly the, the guy who asked the question, he's going to be looking at. That's kind of what um, I want to get. I think, I think a lot of these questions are based around that because it's kind of like they use the – a lot of people talk about, say, the high volume Jay Cutler versus like a low volume Dorian Yates. I kind of want to just talk a little about that because I'm not sh- what Gen Pop does is important, but they're going to be limited by other things. If you've got somebody who's capable of going to the gym six days a week, should they be doing that for the best results? No, <laughs> no, they shouldn't be doing a uh, low volume. 
I, I, I do like higher volumes, to be honest. Mm -hmm. um, my best workouts are whenever I'm on vacation. I do like Vince Gironda type stuff just because it's just, it's just so much fun. Mm -hmm. um, now, I will say this. A stronger muscle over time will be a larger muscle. So if you take someone doing 135 for 20 on a squat and you have them doing 315 for 20 on a squat, will they be bigger? Yes. Now, um, if they get hurt along the way, it's going to delay them, right? So that's why we have different volume approaches, mm -hmm. you know, within the set and rep scheme. Let's say um, they do five by five or five by 10, but with a minute rest, yeah, it's yeah. going to limit the amount of weight that they can do. Mm -hmm. But if they can still, let's say, do 225 for five um, for a five by five a minute rest, and they go up to 275 five by five for a minute rest, will they be a larger person? Yes. Yes. Yeah. That's so a, that's a great way. As long it. as there is a weight change, mm -hmm. and I know, you know, Chester won't say you don't need to add weight. Well, you don't really. I mean, here's another example. Well, he, he, say says, he says that, but um, he does acknowledge that over time you are going to get stronger. Yes. I, I think he just overemphasizes certain portions of what he says to counter what people are saying from, you know, um, the whole mm -hmm. heavy duty approach. So strength is a byproduct of muscle growth, mm. right? Um, so whenever you add a rep in a workout, is it because of that workout? No, it's because your adaptation from the prior workouts. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So let's, that, that's the main point in distinction you kind of want to make because people think it's the workout today that's going to make them grow. No. So it's the pennies in the bank from before. Mm -hmm. um, and going back to the squat example, Okay, let's say you're an advanced person. You're doing 315 for a 5 by 10 minute rest. Okay, you, you don't really want to add more weight to that because it's kind of like, oof, that's a lot of weight. Your knees are hurting, you know, you get little pains and niggles here and there. So what can you do? Well, let's do a leg extension and a leg curl before. Mm -hmm. Awesome. You're going to have to probably cut back to 275 and do a 5 by 10, right? Okay, you get more advanced, you get some muscle growth from that. Let's say you do a leg extension, a leg curl, and then a leg press, and then you do your squats. Okay, or if, if you can still progress on your squats, and let's say you do the five by five, or five by 10 with 275, and then you go up to 285, okay? And then let's say you go back to before, whenever you're doing the 315, and then you add that, and then you go to a 325, you're adding 10 pounds to each one. It's in a different section of the workout. Are you still applying progressive overload? Yes. Is the outcome going to be the same? Most likely. And one will be less dangerous and most likely won't hurt you as much. So this, in, in what you're saying now, you're actually promoting more of the high volume approach. Well, and after a certain point. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. But the same thing can be true. Let's say you do leg extensions for two sets. And then you do leg curls for two sets, and then leg press for two sets, and then you go do squats for two sets. I mean, you, it's still the same principle. Now, just the number of sets. And I think we can go into this in, well, Chris Beardsley has like a, I don't know, you probably saw me post on the research page. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, it's all about um, effective reps, okay? Um, yeah, that's another, that's a, that's a good segue. I, how, what do you think about that? Okay, so... What we know is that 85% uh, of your one rep max, you pretty much engage all the muscle fibers. Mm -hmm. um, and that's like a set of five, a five rep max. Mm -hmm. From the first rep to the fifth one, you engage it. Now, nobody's going to do five sets of their five rep max, okay? Yeah. So then you go into the theory, which he has, and then also, you know, I'm sure some people know about myo reps. Mm -hmm. His thing was effective reps as well. Um, so myo reps for anybody that doesn't know is that you do an activation set. It can be anywhere from uh, 10 to 20 reps. You have like a short rest and let's say you do a 20 rep one. Well, you have five cluster sets or so of three or five reps and you keep going, you know, you get five reps, you rest, keep going, five reps, you rest, keep going, you get four, then you get three, then you get two and then you stop. Yeah, and the so, key, for the for the audience, the key thing with that approach is the rests are very very minimal, so there's much more effective reps. This is what we mm -hmm. said. Yeah, yeah. So the theory with that is that 
you maximally stimulate the muscle in that first set. You have a short rest period. So whenever you begin each next set, your muscles are fatigued enough that they still activate full muscle recruitment. Hmm. Okay. And that's, that's the theory in it. And that's why it works. Yeah. Okay. Just to use, so, use less weight, but still getting the effective yes. reps. Yeah. So let's say you have two sets on a leg extension. They're both to failure. Boom. Both to failure. Let's say you have five. You activate all the muscle recruitment. You know, you activate everything. Okay. So you have five effective reps in that first set. On the second set, you have five effective reps. Okay. So now let's say you do, uh, well, here's an example just because it's easier for me to think about. Five by ten, again, let's say you do a static weight and you shoot for ten reps each time and you only hit failure on the last one. Mm-hmm. Okay? So that first set, it's pretty easy. Yeah. Only like the last rep, you know, has full muscle recruitment. So that's one. Yeah. The next set, you're kind of fatigued. So then you get two. So now you have three effective reps. Okay. The next one, you have um, three effective reps, then four, and then five. So you end up getting about 15 effective reps. Man, I just thought of something now. Lost my mind. Uh, so both of those activate the muscle, but in a different way. And one is less harmful in your joints, mm-hmm. right? Because you're, you're training through fatigue. And the end result will be about the same. So going back to before the amount of you know joint issues and whatnot mentally because which one's mentally easier the one where you go two sets completely to failure or one where you accumulate fatigue and then only on one set you kind of go to failure this is a question so which ones you know yeah i think for me it would probably be the ones where i'm not approaching failure quite as much and just doing more volume Yeah. And we know that failure is not a prerequisite for muscle growth. You don't mm-hmm. need to go to failure. Yeah. Tons of people don't. Look at powerlifters. They don't always go to failure. Yeah, a, a lot of people don't know that. A lot of people still insist failure is necessary. Yeah. Now, what fair, failure does do is that that's it. Yeah. That's all you can do. Mm-hmm. Okay. If, I, if you have two sets, you're going all out. You're going to put everything into it. Mm-hmm. Um, but CNS, um, you're going to break your body down. You don't want to go to the gym. You're going to have anxiety before you go to the gym because, you know, if you don't get nine reps and say the eight is before, you're not going anywhere. But if I have you doing a five by five, five by ten or whatever with a minute rest, it's, it's just a lot easier mentally. Physically, okay. it might not be, but you're not going to beat up your joints as much. Okay. So, you know, so far we've, we've given quite a lot of examples and we've talked quite a lot about studies, but people listen to this and be like, look, bro, over the course of history, bodybuilders have always trained with high volumes. So for the most part, apart from one or two notable exceptions, no one really does low volume. So what's that about? Well, I mean, I'm 173 pounds, like I said before at the moment, and people are like, what does he know? So, <laughs> <laughs> um, but we can, we, we can certainly, we can comment on, you know, what bodybuilders are doing why things are a certain way and you know you know i've been on a very much of a bro kick the last couple of years so th- this is kind of my questions like we're looking at low volume approaches we're looking at studies kind of the same thing with protein intake as well but a lot of and i i'm all for science and more for studies but when when they seemingly fly in the face of what the biggest men on the planet have been doing i think we need to we need to look at that carefully okay so i know you're a fan of minnow yeah, um, yeah, I am. Yeah. Stuff I, I say might mimic him. Hmm. Um, throw splits, they work. Like you can't deny that they work. Everybody has made gains on a bro split. Hmm. Um, most people do a bro split whenever they're a noob. You're gonna make gains no matter what you do. Um, and then they get more targeted and they go into it twice a week, you know, up or lower or something like that. Um, but if you start off doing a bro split and you're like. Like most pro bodybuilders, they do a bro split, right? Mm-hmm. Um, they're pro bodybuilders. They're the genetic elite. Okay. Going back with the protein intake, though, I mean, it works for them. It most likely works for you. But is it going to work for the average person? Yeah, it's going to work. But is it going to be 
as well for the average person as it is for the genetic elite. It's but like, the, thing, the thing is, everything works for the average person. Everything. Mm-hmm. When, you get to the, when you get to those elite levels, you really need to have everything locked down per day to actually make progress. Mm-hmm. So I, I kind of counter that because I, I, I've heard this a lot, again, from the hard gain. I've grew, just years of my first few years of training were full of this. It's like, well, don't copy what the elite do. They can do anything and grow, but they fucking can't. I mean, you look at the Tampa Pro this weekend. Everybody wants to be bigger than the next guy. Everybody. They're doing everything they possibly can. Far more dedication than the average person far more because there's money on the line they're, they're doing what they're doing for, the, for a living we can't we can't i don't feel we can discount those guys who are genetically elite because they're all fighting out against each other they're going to be doing the best approaches so this leads me to my question when you're at the point where you've maxed out or almost maxed out your potential what do you need to do then what, that that's really where i feel this conversation needs to move towards because okay. prior prior to that you can do whatever you like it's going to work. So, so my, question, where, yeah. Yeah. my question is, um, where do you stop? Okay, let's say you're doing a chest workout. Mm. You do flies, you do an incline dumbbell press, you do a decline barbell press, and then you do like a hammer strip. Mm-hmm. Let's say you do five sets for each one. Mm-hmm. Well, you need to make progress. So what are you doing? How do you get, go from, like, where do you go from there? Ideally, practically in a session, you can get to a point where you're, you do your pump starts to go and at that point you, do, you just don't get you've, you've probably had it yourself where you just stop getting contractions and at that mm-hmm. stage i think you're pretty much done and if you're progressing week to week which is which is kind of what most bodybuilders do uh, and they're matching that with their food and all the rest of the supplements and all that kind of stuff they're growing but what i'm saying is ro- you know rather than look at sort of where to go from in terms of adding sets adding volume adding weight that we're looking at a high volume approach, a bro split, what all the big bodybuilders have done and are doing to continue to get bigger and actually win more money. So why, why would we disregard that as, as a way to train, as the best way to train? My thing is just like being redundant. So let's say you can split that chest workout into two days a week, right? Um, and you do flies, incline dumbbell press one day, and then you do decline and the hammer machine the next. Okay, you split it up. Um, I thought like you can get much more quality work splitting that up. Okay, and then pulsing it through the week than you would just doing one, you know, entire session. Because for me, I mean, if I'm going all out and I'm training, twenty sets per muscle group, you know, that's going to kill me in one session. I, I've, I've, once I get to the end, I'm going to be using like a plate on the machine, you know, whenever I could use like two and a half or three, um, if I started it all fresh. So, I mean, I think quality of work comes into play. But is, can, is extra volume redundant though? If volume is the prime driver for growth, is volume ever redundant? I think what we need to get to is like the cap on each session. Right, right, yeah. I think that's the main thing. Cause well, the, there was some research recently which came out saying the cap may be something like 10, 10 to 15 sets, I think, if I remember right off the top of my head. Uh, yeah. But yeah. Well, what, I, I, what, what I would say is with a typical bro workout, you are just going to carry on going past that because you're just going to use lighter weights and lighter exercises like cable crossovers for the chest or straight arm pull downs for the back and stuff like that. So you can, you can keep going. Okay. So I think that goes back. We kind of segue back to the uh, effective reps as in, okay, let's say you have 20, let's say you have 20 sets you do and they're sub maximal. Okay. Are they going to elicit the muscle as much as you do 10 sets maximally? Mm -hmm. No, but it's double the work. And it probably adds up to be about the same as the 10 sets. Mm-hmm. And I can see that being similar. Yeah, um, if you yeah. do, I mean, if potentially, just for, that, potentially just yeah. for less injury risk. Yeah. 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 This is just in theory, you know, yeah. and that's the thing you tell someone to go do 30 sets or whatever. Um, how many of them are quality actually, you know, how many of them are actually good sets? Yeah. But I mean, you're kind of like covering the bases. Mm-hmm. You're making sure you got everything eked out of the muscle. Yeah. And if you're doing it sub-maximally and you accrue enough volume, it's going to match up to do, you know, as you would have lower volume. Because like I had in my example, you can do five sets of easier work 
and it will add up to be the same as two all out. Mm -hmm. So again, that's the thing. I, like I see people, I think it's just because I have it in my head. People are doing volume work and they have about 30 sets. Mm -hmm. um, that's just overkill. I think it's, it's interesting because you and I come from, we come from different countries as well. So in the UK, the heavy duty approach is still very much the thing that people do. Uh, mm -hmm. Not and sometimes not even just two sets for exercise, but like one set for exercise. And I've I've bitched about this quite a lot because what I see and probably what you see with the higher volume guys in your in, in America, what I've seen in England is a lot of the low volume guys they just lift like shit, um, and they they literally look that they're just hanging on for dear life. So I think I think there's a case. I think the the, the poor form can probably be said for both. Yes, totally. Because I, I can go to the gym here, and we'll have we have like three cable stations, and mm. each one will have a person doing flies, and they'll <laughs> sit there for ten to twenty minutes doing nothing but flies. Yeah. All three of them. All, yeah. three of them. all the three stations. That's all they're doing. Yeah. They're just doing flies for twenty minutes. It's like I, I not doing to, anything. I moved a guy once because he was doing that. I just I moved. There were two guys doing flies, so I said. Can you guys just work in together? <laughs> I'm going to use this machine set. <laughs> and then that's the thing. They're in between their sets. They'll talk to each other. Yeah, they're all yeah. friends. It's like, why are you? And it's five o'clock in the afternoon. <laughs> taking, like, really? Yeah. Gosh. But I mean, that's the thing. Are they putting in quality work? I think it's again back to what we want to focus on. Now, if quality work is a constant, I think the why higher volumes end up being better is just because longevity reasons mm -hmm. yes not yeah. everybody is built like jp yeah. jp is five foot six and 300 pounds okay <laughs> i'm sorry i've yet to see a person that massive in my lifetime yeah yeah in person i've yet to see that <laughs> um now have i seen a lot of um no but okay that's why i think volume would be better at the end of the day because less niggles okay mm. less issues on the joints and whatnot um it's easier work so to speak but it's still hard work yeah me mentally you know? easier yeah 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 i, I agree yeah, I it's agree. still hard work and yeah, yeah, yeah. if you have the time to do you know uh six hours of training a week go in and do some volume training yeah okay now if you want to chase some strength and stuff rotate that in and out mm -hmm. i mean it's just simple stuff mm. okay again let's just do a basic leg workout let's say you have a leg extension a leg curl a straight leg dead and then some kind of squat or leg press or something yeah. one phase of the year you do you know volume training and then for a little while you're like okay i want to cut back i want to chase some strength or whatever you want to do a power lift and meet or whatever so you do like a two by five on the squat okay cool you start to get beat up after a while and then you'll, you'll change back into a volume approach i know alex has uh, me and most other guys, Ollie, an example, do that. We kind of rotate yeah. through it. It's kind of like, like a self-built periodization. It's good and I think one reason why periodization does also work is because mentally it's easier to keep a person interested in their training mm. if they change things up every once in a while. Same thing with calorie cycling. I think the reason why that works so well is just because it keeps a person engaged. Yeah, adherence, yeah. And, I, I mean... Like me, I can do the same thing over and over and over again and not get bored. But I'm sure, as you know, some of your clients, they kind of want to change some stuff every once in a while. And they can still make progress on either setup. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think um, I think sort of we, we went roundabout in a few different topics there, but sort of just to summarize that <laughs> section, <laughs> just to summarize that section, I think for Gen Pop, what we're really looking at is their limitations of time and it tends to be mm -hmm. what they're willing to do and get in as much quality training as possible which is 100 percent right and that i do that a lot with my gen pop guys who are limited with time um and you know some of them built fantastic physiques doing that and mark's a great example I mean, he's a tremendous physique just training three or four times a week um and another thing we've kind of looked at in this segment is safety and longevity and if you have the time it may well be in your best interest to do a slightly higher volume approach just because it's safer um, and it may be less stress on the joints. Now, moving on to the next uh, segment of this, looking at motivation. So I think like if you were to get a Dorian Yates or maybe even a modern day Luke Sandow and say, look, you're going to be training high volume now. 
I'm not sure they'll be mentally as into it um, as they would with their heavy duty approaches. So I think motivation possibly plays a bit of a factor as well. Um, how, Back how do you to feel personality. About that? Yeah. Personality. Yeah. Back to that. Yeah. 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 I think that's I think that's a fairly a fairly given for, uh, sort of topic. Yeah. You, seriously, if you don't like like work. Mm. You have two people, one loves their job and the one hates it. He's going to probably do better than the mm. one that loves their job. Yeah. So, yeah, it, it, that's a simple response. And I think that covers everybody. Yeah, definitely. I think there's a, there's a lot to be said for that. I think you, people will look for the new thing to do. There's a lot to be said for placebo. There's a lot to be said for really getting into your program and, and, and enjoying what you do. Um, and I think that's, that's, that's got to be a part of it. So you've, there's got to be a belief because um, mm-hmm. you know we compare low volume versus high volume as I've said there's not a massive amount of difference in the short term but if you really believe in one approach you're just going to go all out and, and do better and, uh, okay another thing is that when I mean, you talk about the capability of a person to go all out in every single set okay mm-hmm. obviously the first weekend on doing a low volume approach people mm-hmm. can do that okay it's whenever you're four weeks in and you can't add anything and you're grinding it out. Yeah. Okay. You get anxiety trying to beat the logbook. People <laughs> pace. I, I, I'm sure if anybody hasn't, go watch the Revive Stronger podcast with Mike and uh, JP. JP, yeah. They talk about that. Yeah. They yeah. talk about it. And it's true. It happens. You get anxiety, especially on some movements. And that's not for everybody. And Yeah. I, I, also and, think, I also think that's going to put people off actually focusing on the muscle as well. Like yeah. if, if you're that focused and, and anxious about beating the logbook, I'm not sure you're going to be that concerned about placing the stress onto your pecs kind of thing. Do you know what I mean? Has, like, sub, it's, even subconsciously, you're like, okay, I'm still training the muscle, but part of you is like, I got to beat the logbook. So yeah. what are you training? If, if you're doing an exercise and you don't feel the muscle at all, mm-hmm. all you feel is the joints, you're probably going too heavy. Yeah. And you see that with like, let's say laterals. <laughs> I'm sure you've seen people in the gym. Oh yeah, yeah. Like I'm doing 25s or something and they're over there doing 60s and they're smaller than me. Yeah. I, I just don't get that. The worst, um, the worst in over here is uh, Romanian deadlifts. You know, ever since JP did that video in February, I've, oh I've, gosh. I've bitched about this so much, but I'm going to bitch about it again. The every, every single UK coach just started in Romanian deadlifts and then put a band around their ass as well. And it was all, all to the logbook and they all look like shit. Uh, but look, and, look, they're trying to activate the glutes, man. <laughs> activate the glutes, man. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> got, to, got to activate the uh. glutes. <laughs> yeah. It was, uh, and the band does do that, but it's like, okay, that, that's yeah. like semantics. What are you doing? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, a band definitely does, but I think the, you know, I think the application is all over the place. I actually, I saw, um, I saw one CrossFit box around here start to do banded kettlebell swings, and what? I just thought what? that is literally the most stupid thing I've seen in my life. I and I've seen some shit like so. They were putting a, a band around their feet and then uh, then attached to the kettlebell and then swinging it up. So the point of the highest amount of resistance has as much resistance was at the top, top anyway, yeah. and now they're adding a band to it. So it literally makes no sense at all if you think about the proper use of a band. I thought my suggestion was if they put a band around the back of their head and then attach to the kettlebell, it may just swing and decapitate them. And then we well, would all I just be had put a out of our misery. Of, like the band slipping uh, in it, like yeah. why not? And, like hitting them someplace. It's it like, works yeah. if we if we did that yeah. and it decapitated yeah. them, but we wouldn't have to see it on Instagram. So that would be yeah. my suggestion. It's I like mean, the blood flow <laughs> restriction training. If you want a full body blood flow restriction, just do it around your neck. And you know, I'm just, <laughs> and that's the thing. People had to put a disclaimer because people thought that was real. Holy Some shit! Some idiots out there thought that was going to actually happen. Who said that? Read it. Was that? I don't know. Was it Reddit or something? Yeah, great. Seriously. That's yes, hilarious. Like, no. It's like, okay, that's Doran Nizzle at its finest. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It was just <laughs> honestly the stupidest thing I've seen in my life. And then, Jeez. you know, the, 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 the defense is always there. Well, it's, you know, it's something new. I enjoyed it. It's like, okay, great. You know, that's, mm-hmm. that's cool. That's fine. Um, yeah, all good. So, okay, cool. So, motivation we've kind of covered. I think we can, we can both agree that if it's something that you're more interested in, you're going to do better on it. Um, uh, and it's something you believe in more, you're probably going to do better on it as well. So the, the final one that I wanted to talk about was um, tendon strength, which kind of relates to, to my theory on who should be doing high volume approaches and who shouldn't be. And I talked 
briefly to Sid about this in the last podcast as well, but just to kind of reiterate that for, for the current audience, um, I think that tendon strength is the big limiting factor in terms of what type of approach you should do. And I think if you're built like a Dorian and your tendons are strong enough to be able to give your muscles a full, good, strong stimulus every single rep, you're good to go with heavy weights. But if you are less than robust, which yeah, I, well, I'm just going to say not even less than robust, I'm just going to say typically, genetically, typically average, per rep, you're not going to be able to exert as much force onto the muscle because you'll be limited by your joints. So let's, let's just take a really quick example of a, of a bicep curl. Let's say your, your tendons are strong enough to handle a 40 kilo bicep curl. Anything more than that, 50 kilos, for example, you're going to be limited by your tendon strength. So you're not going to be able to put the muscles through as much of a, a good workout as you would do with 40 kilos, if that makes sense. So I think you'd be better off doing a high volume approach. And, and then the other factor of that is potentially splitting up your workload through another session in the week. So when you're lifting, um, you have slight deformations in your tendons and during the course of the workout, your tendons could get deformed to the point where, again, that reduces their capacity to produce uh, and keep up with the amount of force that the muscles needed. So in that sense, let's say a guy who's got a robust structure does a set of six to eight, he might get a lot more, his muscles might get a lot more out of that six to eight than I might get because my muscles just wouldn't be able to withstand, my, my tendons, sorry, wouldn't be able to withstand the weight needed to put my muscles through a really great workout. So I would say a high volume approach for someone who's genetically typical and potentially splitting up the, the volume for someone like that as well. Potentially, I'm not, I'm, I have my own thoughts about that as well. What do, you, what do you think to that? I think this goes back to the scrawny guys in the gym that say, hey, I'm doing heavy duty type training and it works <laughs> for me and it's awesome. Yeah. And I've yet to see a massive person do heavy duty cell training that did not get hurt. Yes, yes. I'm yet to see it happen. I, I think that can sum up everything. Yeah. They both work, okay? But you got to think about uh, practicality, mm. as in how often you can train. And the biggest thing for muscle stimulation is the more often you can train a muscle, the more often you can recover from training a muscle, and then also worry about CNS, you know? Yeah. So, yeah, I yeah, I, I think so. I think that that's a good way of putting it. Um, and yeah, I've I've yet to see anyone get super big and, and not get injured. Even even Dorian towards the end of his career. And um, while I like fingers cross, Luke doesn't get hurt. I was just about to say that. Massive. I was yeah, just like, about to say that. Yeah, I just I'm just he, waiting. Yeah. I'm really just waiting. Yeah. To be honest, I'm waiting with JP as well because I, I saw him do. Uh, I think it was T-Bar Rose once, just super heavy. And he honestly he just looks like he's hanging on for dear life. And I like, no disrespect to JP because I actually really like JP. And I know I bitch a lot about JP clones, but I've got a lot of respect for JP because he has his own ideas and he's done a tremendous amount for British bodybuilding. So I've got a lot of time for him. But sometimes when he's doing his sets, I, I just think something just shit's just going to fly off his bone. Like his low his spine is just going to. Watch gone. him do his reps. He's shaking. Yeah. Yeah, yeah he's that's shaking right. The whole entire time. Like, I don't see how he can feel the muscle. Like, he probably totally can. But like whenever I get like that, I, I can't feel anything. Yeah. And I, I really okay. I think you you talk about the horde gainer forums and stuff. Mm. Um, I feel like once you become enhanced and you're using so much weight, mm. going low volume, super low volume, just isn't safe. Yeah. I mean, there is a drastic difference between someone deadlifting 400 pounds and someone deadlifting 600. It was a drastic <laughs> difference. Yeah, there is. Drastic. And that, yeah, people, and I mean, yeah, I'm 170 pounds right now. Um, I got to a 600 pound deadlift, deadlifting two sets every other week on that movement. Okay. Um, I can't do the same kind of volume though, or training that I could where I was doing a 315 deadlift for, you know, high volume. Yeah. Whenever I'm doing 500 for a set of 10 on deadlifts, I usually break. Yeah, see, I, I read a comment on a forum and someone said that they were convinced that the JP method was the best method of slapping on muscle. But that person still only used 50 kilo dumbbells for dumbbell bench press. Mm -hmm. I, I, I know I'm going to sound like a dick when I say this, um, 
but they're not qualified to talk about best approaches if they're only handling 50 kilo per hand because they, they're not lifting anywhere near enough weights to actually fuck themselves up. Like that's yeah. baby weight. Um, so they don't, they, they don't, they're not qualified to have an opinion on, on, a, on, a, on something which is contingent on them potentially injuring themselves with heavy, heavy weight. No one's getting injured with 50 kilo dumbbells. No one. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. I, 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 I seem to, I, I, you know, to back to what you're saying is at, at a certain level of strength, when you're, when you're relatively beginner to beginner slash intermediate, you're not going to know. And, and you can pretty much do whatever you like. Yeah. 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 I mean, it, you can be, okay. It, again, the recovery standpoint of someone using a 600 pound deadlift compared to yeah. 400, is just totally drastic. And people don't understand that until they, we had this, discuss, I won't name who it is, but we were on the forums, you know, talking about that. And mm. once you get to this point, in order to advance, you need to change your exercise selection and whatnot. Yes. Like lean gains with uh, Morgan, Morton Burkham, you know, yeah. with his low volume reverse pyramid. R- RPT, yeah, yeah. It works, but I don't see that being feasible for someone who's actually massive. Yeah. And the guy he looks great. He does. Yeah, he does. He gets yeah. results for his clients. Mm. Now, a lot of people that are big proponents of it, like JP, an example, it works for his body and he can handle it. Mm-hmm. Dorian Yates, he can handle it. You know, for darn sure, if Dorian could not recover from his mm-hmm. approach at all, he would probably change something. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, he, he's, he's uh, cerebral enough to, to do that, yeah. Yeah, he would. He, he would not be totally married to his approach if he was getting injured every month. He would look to change it so he could win. Yeah. Um, and a lot of people get married to, it becomes like a religion, same thing with diets. People <laughs> become married to a, a system because it works initially for them, and then they get scared to branch out and try new things. And then like you were saying, with your protein intake, you're not going to say it's the best thing ever, but you see that. People will try a new magazine routine, and they're like, oh my gosh, <laughs> the best results I've ever gotten. And they keep saying that, they keep saying that. And then you go to the gym, 10 years later and see them they're the same size using the same weight and they still say that man i'm getting so much bigger it's like no you look just like you did 10 years ago <laughs> yeah yeah and you see that all the time yeah. people get too married to their approach and they don't want to change things up yeah. now i'm raining finally i guess i finally woke up <laughs> yeah okay so we've we've sort of covered um tens and strength as well i think just to kind of summarize that i'd say there probably is a certain point you get to where not only do high volumes become more attractive, but probably necessary to reduce the load on the bar. So you gave your example of switching up the exercise order. You can also use um, tighter rest periods, higher rep ranges. You can change the exercise uh, order around. So all these things you can do. Um, yeah, awesome. There was another thing I was going to say about the high low volume approach. I can't quite remember it now. But yeah, I think we've covered some pretty good stuff. I like it. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I already showed you my question I had um, from Henry, but well, so, is there any other questions? No, I think, we're, I think we're good yeah. for questions. There was something just burning in my, in my brain that I wanted to, to ask, but it's gone now. I might have to get you back on to do another one. Um, but yeah, well, I think we'll, we'll call it there. Uh, it just, just before you go, um, just about you personally, um, plans for competition, career, what's, what's new for you? Well, so I took the last year off mm-hmm. and I say that and people were like, yeah, but you look like you used to work out. Yeah. Okay. I got, <laughs> I got burnout. Mm-hmm. I really did. I got burnout a year ago. You're looking, so I was you're looking great thing. at the moment, man. Thank you. Thank you. So I took like a year or so off, um, cleaned out, mm-hmm. um, of everything. And I just didn't track what I was eating. Pretty much just went by fill. Um, was training three times a week because that's what I could manage at the time. 30 minute sessions. Um, and I dropped about 30 pounds over the last, you know, 10, nine months. Uh, got back with Alex not too long ago. Um, end goal, if you want to put a number on it, I guess I would like to be, you know, 220 pounds or so at 10%, basically the same body fat I'm at now, but that's like a three year, four year goal. So I got a lot of time ahead of me just doing it. Um, you had asked me my own training approach the other day if it's going to change. And honestly, yeah. I mean, I'm going to milk what I can out of this yeah. for right now, the, a little bit lower volume, 
say 10 sets, you know, per week, but yeah. I have muscle memory. I think the first 20 pounds are going to come back quick once I can finally get a caloric intake that suits me. And then uh, after that, go back to the volume, cut back on compounds that don't really grieve me, nurse some uh, injuries I got, and uh, competing, nah, I'll let my uh, clients do that. <laughs> awesome yeah. awesome um all right brilliant well once again thanks for uh coming on okay it's been a good uh, hour and um yeah. yeah brilliant man and uh, enjoy it enjoy the good sunday morning chat yeah yeah it's been good uh and uh we'll, we'll have to do it again sometime we'll get some we'll some more q and a's going yeah i like it all right awesome. cheers, buddy. thank you uh, appreciate it bye